we pray, dear Lord, this sermon of mine isn't all that much, but I've worked honestly on it as the best that I can do, at least at the moment. I know that any good which may come from this sermon will be your doing and not mine. Please help me to live that I may become an increasingly uncluttered channel of your grace. And to that end, may I think your thoughts after you and speak your word. I love you. I love these people whom I am privileged to serve. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm honored to be here once again. <clears throat> to my knowledge, I preached here twice. Once, uh, when I was still district president, when uh, Pastor Del Roth retired, he asked me to come and preach for his retirement, which was uh, somewhat unusual, but I have had a great joy in doing so. And at the Bible class later on, I'll tell you a story about that, which I think you'll find very humorous. And then the second time was a little bit later, I don't think I was president anymore, uh, Pastor John Diefenthaler was president, and uh, that was during the Ablaze Movement, and I was here to collect money. I don't know why I get stuck with collecting money all the time, but apparently that's my job. But it's a joy to be here again and to experience the hospitality and love that I've already experienced this morning from so many of you, and especially from Pastor Kevin Robin and his dear wife, Teresa, who kept me last night and fed me last evening. And, uh, and it's just been a joy to be with them once again. In Matthew chapter 25, we read the gospel lesson a little while ago, and it talks about serving the least among you. And I'll talk about that a little bit in the sermon, serving the least. And then Jesus says, when you serve those least people, those down and outers, you're really serving me. Serve the poor. And we do so with, with a number of people of various denominations. Through all of my ministry and in growing up where my father was a pastor, uh, I always served Lutherans or worked with Lutherans. And uh, now I'm working with people <coughs> of various denominations and it's kind of refreshing. And they give me the opportunity to speak to them when they gather together. It's really fun with other faiths. And so we break down the barriers that we have with one another in these different faiths with Christ's love. So Matthew chapter, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Matthew 12, or Mark chapter 12. I'll use that as a text this morning. For Jesus has asked the greatest commandment. He said the greatest one is love God. And then the second is like us. You love your neighbor as yourself. And I suppose I really want to emphasize the latter, although the former as well. And from Jesus, we are motivated to that kind of love for people who are without. Stephen was appointed member in the New Testament to be the person who helped those who were down and out. And uh, somehow or another, the Jewish authorities thought of him as kind of a bad apple. And I think so because he not only gave to the poor, but he but he also told them about Jesus. And that's what Food for the Poor does too, by the way. We get to feed them, but we also tell them about Jesus, and they're much more open to hear about Jesus once they receive food. So Stephen talked to talk, and he walked to walk. And Jesus followed. Stephen followed Jesus, even though he knew that it was going to be painful, even to death. Now, you know, the makers of iodine some years ago decided that they would create an iodine that didn't stink. But it didn't go over. People realized that when it didn't sting, they said to themselves, it's not working, you know? And so they put the sting back into iodine. Well, serving Jesus sometimes creates a sting or a sacrifice on our part. And Stephen sought to be faithful in spite of that sting. Are you willing to suffer some inconvenience in Jesus' name? Stephen did, and he died because of it. Well, 
the debt holding their hands, only that which they are giving, given away. Paul said, look out for others in Philippians chapter 2. Nothing costs as much as love, except perhaps non-love. Nothing costs as much as caring, except perhaps not caring. And our current text really has a vertical relationship and a horizontal relationship. It's like a cross. Love God, love neighbor. It looks like a cross to me. In fact, Jesus got these words from Deuteronomy chapter 6, which says to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And Jesus adds mind as well. And then the cross section, horizontal, he got from Leviticus 19, love your neighbor as yourself. So the cross, really, when you think about it, is a capital I, crossed out, so that we are not the important ones, but God is. The Hebrew word for love is not a warm and fuzzy. It's an action word. James says, if you suffer, if a sister or a brother lacks anything, and you say to them, peace be unto you, stay warm, eat well, but you don't do anything about it, what good is that, James tells us. Our caring makes faith come alive. So that many Christians today seem to want to be a Christian in an advisory capacity, but that doesn't work to be a spectator sport within the Christian faith. It looks like a cross, doesn't it? And it leads to life, a life of service. Well, some time ago, I mentioned it before, I was in, in Haiti, and uh, I was there really on behalf of you and the many others who served <coughs> the for the poor. And in Haiti, you remember back in 2010, January, they had this tremendous earthquake in which 100,000 people lost their lives. And people without food and water and, and without a place to sleep. And to make matters even worse, looters came along and took the few things that they did have away, visited the Roman Catholic and the, and the Church of England cathedrals. They were in shambles. Just a few walls standing up, jagged edges here and there. But the survivors in this poorest of the poor nations in the Western Hemisphere, Haiti, the survivors, are kind of like those mentioned in Ezekiel, who rose up like dry bones to build God's house once again, and to build their churches. It's amazing. We have a number of Lutherans within Haiti, a number of Lutheran pastors, and, and even an orphanage there, and they're considering building a seminary as well. In fact, there's Lutherans in just about every one of these countries that are mentioned on that map in your brochure, <coughs> in the bulletin. The world says to us, the more you take, the more you have. God says to us, the more you give, the more you are. Luther once said, I don't think it'd be a good Lutheran sermon without quoting Luther. Luther said, the only thing that I really have held on to is that which I gave away. A personal hug sometimes is, is, is enough to help some people. And we did this when we were in Haiti. We, we hugged the people, we kissed them on the cheek. We touched them. It made such a difference. I remember visiting my wife Anne one time when, when uh, she was in the hospital for bypass surgery. And I was still working. I was with the district at the time. <clears throat> and I'm dressed in a black suit and a clerical collar, kind of like I have on now. And it was Catholic Hospital, so that was appropriate. And I walked into her room, <clears throat> and, and I went to her bedside, and I gave her a kiss, and I told her I loved her, had a short devotion with her, gave her a kiss, told her I loved her, and I left. Now, the woman that was in the room with her didn't know who I was. <laughs> so she says to Anne, Anne, your priest is sure a lot friendlier than my priest. <laughs> Anne never did tell who I was. <laughs> I didn't know that. 
But the woman was, was, was impressed with, with my concern. And, and the people that we serve in these various countries are impressed with our concern. Jesus touched, the, how many times it mentions in scripture that Jesus touched somebody, touched the leper, for example. Well, you can touch these people with your gifts. Ephesians 2 is a passage that we Lutherans really love to quote. By grace are we saved through faith, not of ourselves, a gift of God, not of works, as any should boast. We forget the next verse, verse 10, which says, we are God's workmanship created for good works. Not saved by works, but saved for works. And God gives us all that we need to support body and life, as we recite in the Catechism. And he gives us this so that we can help others as well. You know, years ago, when I was a young pastor of ministry, even much younger than Pastor Kevin Brown, uh, an old Moravian pastor came up to me, and he said, Roy, some of you Lutherans are going to miss heaven by 12 inches. I said, that's not very far. He said, that's far enough. You're going to miss heaven. I said, how do you figure that? He said, well, you Lutherans know all those nice things in catechism. You know, you can distinguish between law and gospel. You can distinguish between objective and justice and subjective justification. You can you name a number of other things. But you don't always exercise it in your heart. That's the 12 inches. You know, from here to here, he said. I said, I said to the man, you've got a point. You've got a point. Our text speaks about love. You know, John, according to tradition, is the one disciple that lived long ago, died a natural death. And I visited the island of Patmos, by the way, and I led world tours after I left the district presidency. And we were on that island. And I could just imagine John being there and what he said. Because he was asked to speak in a lot of places. He was an old man, like I am, you know. And, and he went around speaking. And, and his speech was always the same one. Love one another. That was his speech. Love one another. And, and everybody would say, well, do you have anything else to say? He'd say, this is tradition, by the way, not Bible. He'd say, just love one another. Well, in 1 John 4, he writes, if God loved us, we ought to love one another. And I thought about using that as a text for the sermon. I've also thought about the Deuteronomy 15 one. This is a good one, too. Blessings come to those who are poor and those who help the poor. Or Amos 5. Um, I'm not, God says, I don't care much about your ceremonies care about what you do. And then his first sermon. Jesus' first sermon was in his hometown Nazareth. Now, I remember preaching in my hometown Nazareth, in my hometown Union, Missouri, it was in Foothills, the Ozarks. My high school, high school buddies <clears throat> all sat in the front row. They said they were going to make faces at me. I, I don't know if they did. I didn't look at them. You know, I looked, looked beyond them. Anyway, you remember your first sermon? Uh, the very first sermon I preached was in Bell and Owensville, Missouri. I'm sure it doesn't mean anything to you. But I got up early in the morning, you know, like 4 o'clock, maybe 3 o'clock, studied that sermon for the umpteenth time, my dad knew it. At the breakfast table, my dad says, boy, let me see your sermon. So I'm glad you showed it to him. I had it all typed up there, you know. And he looked at it, he paged through it, and he said, it looks pretty good to me. Whereupon he tears it to shreds. <laughs> and I said, to Dad, I need that sermon. I reach that sermon in, in a couple of hours. And, and, I, and besides, I got a B on it, or was it a C? I'm pretty sure I passed it anyway. And uh, from Doc Kemmerer, I don't know if you had him or not. Okay. But, uh, and my dad looked at me, and I'll never forget what he said. He said, Roy, focus on Jesus. And I remember that every time I prepared or preached a sermon. Focus on Jesus. Well, I don't know whether Jesus' high school buddies were sitting here making faces at him in Nazareth, but we do know what his text was for his first sermon. Isaiah 61. I came to preach the gospel to the poor. That could have been my text, too. 
For Matthew 25, your pastor chose that as a gospel lesson for today. Whatever you do to the least of these, you do it unto me. Reach out to the poor and you will see Jesus. Surprise someone by letting Christ shine through you. Uh, back to the Catholic hospital I went to, I'm black dressed, clerical scholar, shot in power and, and black suit. And I go to the elevator on the first floor. And you know how elevators are. The elevator was practically full of people. But somebody said, come on in, you know, Father. We'll make room for you. So, you know, they, they back up. It's Catholic hospitals. They called me Father. So everybody kind of scrunches together and, and they allow me to go into the elevator. Too. And you know how it is on elevators. People walk on the elevator and they turn around and face the door. That's a tradition, isn't it? And there are great conversations before they get in. But the elevator, when they get to the elevator, everything's quiet. They stop their conversation. You notice that? Yeah, I see your head's going up and down. Now, uh, elevators are probably the quietest place in the whole world, you know, no matter how many people are in there. So I decided to change that. So I get on the elevator, instead of turning around and facing the door, I face the people, raise my hands up like this, and I say, okay, now all together, amazing grace. And, you know, before we got to the sixth floor, we had, we had everybody singing, amazing grace. The doors go flying open to the people out here on the sixth floor wondering what in the world is coming up here. But the scripture says, declare his glory, Psalm 96 to those who are around you. But we do this together. We've got a lot of people, over a million, over, over a, well, many more than a million. And we received more than a billion dollars last year. And less than 4% of that is spent on overhead, including sending people like, like me out in order to proclaim the gospel and encourage people to give and support the poor. We do it together. I've mentioned before I was raised in the foothills of the Ozarks, and a lot of the uh, streets around the, the town and in the town were, uh, were dirt or gravel, and they weren't paved. <clears throat> and it wouldn't rain a lot, it would be mud. And this one car got stuck in the mud, and one of the farmers came along and we had a mule, you know, one of those Missouri mules, and he hooked the, car, the mule up to the car, pulled it out, and the mule's name was Ben. And after he hooks Ben up, who's got these blinders on like this, he can't see on either side or behind him, the mule, he says, okay now, go, Susie, go, Jack, go, Bill, go, Ben. And we're all looking to see, so we got one there, name was Ben. I said, how come your name all was, why don't you just say, go, Ben, to begin with? He said, if Ben thought he was the only one that was pulling that car, he wouldn't have even tried. <laughs> so, he, he, there, are, there are people all over who are supporting food for the poor. It's a great ministry. Surrounded by, by, we're surrounded by greatness, great people in Hebrews chapter 12. <clears throat> one million interfaith ministry. Well, with those thought in mind, uh, by the way, in Strasbourg, Germany, during the Second World War, the cathedral was destroyed, but the statue of Christ remained, except for his hands, which were blown off. And the people of Strasbourg said, well, we're going to replace the hand. But the, the leaders decided, no, we'll leave the hands off, even to this day, in that statue. The hands are no longer there. And there's an expression that says, Jesus has no hands in our hands to do his work today. And that, that's a, a real powerful symbol. So anyway, take out your uh, brochure uh, for Food for the Poor, if you will, just open it up. And you see, I'm not going to read it to you. And this is a new one. This came out last week, by the way. <clears throat> and you'll see that there ways in which you can help the poor. You know, $43 to feed a hungry child for an entire year. Uh, well, you can see how, and, and what you can do there, you see where it's highlighted with yellow uh, on that one side, not on the map side, the other side, and where it's highlighted with yellow, you just pull that off like that, and you've got an envelope in your hand, like this, 
And you can either turn it in to me when I brief you just after the work of service today, or you can send it in, as you see, it's a red stamp, and you can send it in with, with money in one way or another. I know that some of you are supporting the group for You had someone here back in 2009. And, uh, and I compliment you and thank you for that. Food for the Poor is the largest international relief organization in America. And uh, we work in 17 countries, and there are Lutherans in just about all these countries. Roman Catholic Church isn't doing well in many of those countries for some reason, but uh, Lutherans and other denominations are drawing them in. We supply water and medicines and uh, education, homes. Uh, we build homes for $3,600. It's amazing how many people are willing to give a home, $3,600, or groups like Bible class. And you'll receive a picture of the family that moves into it, along with their thanks as well. And uh, we, we have orphanages that we support, uh, aged people, and we support adults, so that people can be self-supporting. And more than 96% goes to actually do that. As often as you do this for the least of those around us, our doctor says you are doing it to me. One million dollars, and I encourage you to help support that ministry. <clears throat> One dollar will bring eighty-eight dollars of drugs that drug companies give to us. That's part of the billion dollars, the monies that various companies give the food for the poor. One dollar will send eighty-eight dollars of drugs to the needy. Five dollars. A hundred will feed a hundred children food for a day. And food for the poor feeds more than a million people every day. We dig wells, we build pig farms, tilapia farms, in order that people can become self-sustaining and help expand schools. I went to a school, a Lutheran school in the mountains of Guatemala that had 350 children. And Food for the Poor was expanding it so that they could serve 700 children. No school of any kind within 50 miles except for that, that school right there. The scripture says, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. I'll take a generous route any day. <laughs> You may give without loving, but you can't love without giving. <coughs> and our motivation is Jesus Christ. You see, there are five monosyllables that are summation of our Christian faith for all time. Christ died for our sins. And that, that's in 1 Corinthians 15. In that same chapter, there's another set of five monosyllables. Christ rose from the dead. That's it. Those two sets of monosyllables. That's the power to love and to serve and to share. I believe the best is yet to come, the worst is over. Christ died for us. Christ rose again for us. Psalm 21. If we close our ear to the poor, we might cry out someday and not be heard. And so, I pray once again. May the peace of God which rests all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds. Okay, <coughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you.